With this video, we're going to continue considering molecular orbital theory, but we're going to move beyond uh, what we've seen so far, which could be called sort of an effective Hamiltonian way to implement molecular orbital theory, and begin to explore semi-empirical approximations that move closer to a first principles ultimate ab initio uh, molecular orbital theory. And in particular, what I'm going to uh, do today is lay the foundations by talking about Slater determinantal wave functions and Hartree-Fock theory. And once we've laid those foundations out in full detail, we'll examine in subsequent videos how semi-empirical theory makes certain approximations to simplify calculations and potentially do so in a chemically useful way. So let me begin by thinking about a one electron wave function again. And I'll simply review from, from some prior lectures that the units of the wave function are such that when you square it, you get electron per volume. And as a result, and that's the units that is, uh, and as a result, we think of that as a so-called probability density. It's per volume, so it's a density. And it's a number that can be normalized so that it would uh, integrate over all space to be equal to 1, so that uh, the probability of finding an electron somewhere in space is 1 as you integrate over all space. But it's continuous distribution. And so a valid wave function in Cartesian coordinates, here's an example of one. This is a, a true solution to the uh, one electron hydrogenic atom problem in quantum mechanics. And so you see that this particular function expressed in Cartesian coordinates, so the variables of the function phi are x, y, and z, and a parameter in appearing in the function is the atomic number z, so that's the charge on the nucleus. And I would call out sort of four uh, components of this particular function. One is a normalization factor, so a whole bunch of constants, including the nuclear charge, that are there ultimately so that when one performs the integration over all space, it does indeed integrate to one. And so that gives rise to these seemingly curious numbers like the square root of pi and 81 and so forth. There is also a factor that involves the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So x squared plus y squared plus z squared, that would be in radial uh, com uh, coordinates, that's r. So actually it's r squared and then we take the square root. So this is r and it says that as we move out radially from the origin, and the origin will be taken to be the nuclear position, well, at very short distances r, 6 will be larger than z times a number close to 0, and so this will be a positive term. And then as we move out far enough, r will become big enough that when multiplied times z, it will exceed 6, and this will become negative. So this term in parentheses switches from positive to negative at some characteristic distance. There's also, in this particular function, simple multiplication by y, and so that's going to introduce a Cartesian directionality. It doesn't have to be there. This is just an example function. But in any case, for positive values of y, you'll be multiplying times a positive number. And for negative values of y, you'll be multiplying times a negative number. And then finally, there is a, a damping term as a way to think about it. It's an exponential to a negative value of something that must be positive because the nuclear charge is positive, And here's our friend r again. And so this says that as r increases, I am going to die off exponentially, and ultimately this exponential will kill y, which is going to infinity as you go off in the y direction. But an exponential dies faster than a, a linear term increases. And so this ensures that as I go out infinitely far, the function goes to zero, and that basically ensures square integrability. That is, when I evaluate uh, this function times itself to get the square integrated over all space, because that's what I need to get probability, I'll have a capability of integrating to a finite number, not an infinite number. And if you think about what this function looks like as I've described it, it looks like this. It is a 3p-like orbital. It changes sign along either uh, up or down I'm going to take as y. So y is this way positive and this way negative. And I'm trying to indicate a sign change. So that's this factor here affecting the sign as I go out and I change at this position in space. So there's a true node here where it'll be zero. Uh, and 
the lines, if you like, are chosen as sort of arbitrary contour levels. I know it goes to zero, and maybe I choose to draw the line when it reaches a value of 0 0.01 atomic units, for example. So this line is really a phase line. This is just some boundary I set arbitrarily. Because there is amplitude, even infinitely far out, it's just that the amplitude is incredibly small and vanishingly small as I go farther and farther. Okay, so uh, this is just a repeat of everything I've said so far, uh, but what I want to do now is sort of illustrate that integral. So, in essence, if you were interested in asking, what is the probability that I will find my electron within a range of x values, y values, and z values, I would find that by performing the integration over those Cartesian coordinates, so x running from x1 to x2, y from y1 to y2, z from z1 to z2, square of the wave function. So this is a real wave function. It's, it's really just squaring it. If it were complex, I would multiply times its complex conjugate, but this example is not complex. And when I carry out that integration, which doesn't look like it would be the most enjoyable integral you've ever done in your life, but it's actually not all that bad, especially if this truly were uh, transformable to spherical coordinates, it'd be trivial. Uh, but in any case, we would uh, carry out the integration. It would be some number less than one, and I've I ensure it's less than one by, for instance, just integrating over this piece over infinite limits. That adds up to some finite number, and I, uh, I multiply by this, which is one over that number, in order to get normalization. So that's always how you get normalization. All right, and in any case, so that defines the probability density, and it's a perfectly nice atomic-like orbital, which could be used as a basis function. So now when I want to make a better one electron wave function in a molecule, not in an atom, I might imagine that I would take this molecular orbital wave function as a linear combination of basis functions that are atomic orbitals. So uh, now I will have these primitive functions, I might call them, or basis functions. They'll be one electron orbitals that might satisfy a one electron Schrodinger equation for an atomic uh, system. But I'm going to take up to capital N of them and add them together with characteristic coefficients, and that will define a molecular orbital. So, for example, consider a CH bond. So here is a carbon bonded to hydrogen, and I'll take a bonding orbital. And that implies that I'll have some sort of in-phase sigma-like orbital. Now, in order for carbon to bond more effectively to hydrogen, I might like to direct some of my amplitude of a, of a carbon set of orbitals, if you will, towards the hydrogen. And I would do that by, for instance, mixing in p character. So I can take a carbon s orbital and a p orbital. When I sum these together, they'll be in phase on this lower side, and they're out of phase up here. So I'll reduce the amplitude in this region, but I'll increase it here, which will be good for bonding. And for the hydrogen, I can bring in an s orbital, and I can also bring in a p orbital. And well, it might look curious to say, oh, I'll bring a p orbital from hydrogen, because we know that hydrogen atom in its ground state doesn't have occupied p orbitals. It's worthwhile to become very used to the word orbital and the word function being used simultaneously, really to mean the same thing. So this is just a mathematical function that I can use to describe a better molecular orbital, and I can use it in expanding a wave function. And to make that really clear, an alternative approach I could choose to use would be, in fact, to build up this orbital as a linear combination of a series of s functions laid out in space along the path of this uh, CH bond, so the same vector, if you like. And you can sort of see that if I added them together roughly as drawn, sure enough, the sum of all their amplitudes would look a lot like this CH sigma type orbital. Uh, this is nominally in organic chemistry. We call this something like an sp3 orbital on carbon, bonding with an s orbital on hydrogen. But that's more a nomenclature thing than anything else. It is construct. It can be constructed as a sum of basis functions. And if you think to yourself, well, why would I ever want to do it this way? That seems kind of non-intuitive. Actually, because it involves only s-type orbitals, which have very nice functional forms compared to p orbitals, for instance. Uh, it makes some of the calculations easier, so there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. It looks like you'd need more of them in a sense, because you've got to lay them out in space, and they're not centered on nuclei, 
But it's good to just appreciate that any set of functions at any position in space can be used, and it's just a question of computational convenience what you ultimately decide to use. But certainly one bottom line conclusion is the more basis functions, the better, because you will be able to mathematically describe more complexity in actual shape because you're adding and subtracting uh, more and more things. And that's, that's a general rule. More basis functions is better. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, we've already reviewed that the variational principle says if we want to optimize the coefficients, these coefficients appearing in a molecular orbital, we can take advantage of the variational principle to minimize the energy, and calculus says that when we do that minimization, we generate this secular equation, which will have n roots e, that is, there are capital N energies, which allow the secular equation to be true, namely that this determinant formed by these integrals, resonance integrals and overlap integrals, can be equal to zero. And when we go and find those values of E, that allows us to solve a set of linear equations that gives us our coefficients A. And I'm not going to fully recap that. What I want to do is uh, look closely again at these integrals that appear in the uh, secular determinant. And now, think about it beyond the effect of Hamiltonian, which we looked at previously, and recognize that included in the com computation of the energy, there is a kinetic energy component. So here's a kinetic energy integral between two MOs, I and J. There is a nuclear attraction integral. And then something, in a sense, we ignored in its, in its explicit form when we looked at Huckel theory, there is an electron-electron repulsion integral. So in Huckel theory, because we, we basically took our matrix element values from experiment to the extent that there were electron-electron repulsions involved, we worked them into certain parameter values that, uh, you know, since they measured experiment, they included electron-electron repulsion. The problem was that we generated orbitals that way that we would use for different numbers of electrons, and as a result, we were insensitive to the interactions between electrons as we began to fill up those orbitals. And that's why Huckel theory does much better for the allyl cation than it does for the radical, than it does for the anion, because you are adding an increasing number of electrons as you go from a positive to a negative charge. And so one way to think about the electron repulsion term is, I'm seeking this matrix element Ij, so molecular orbitals I and J, and I'm interacting with the full electron density. That is, I would sum over all the electrons what are the, and that's dictated by the molecular orbitals, so I'm summing over occupied molecular orbitals as a way to think about it. Phi squared, because that gives me electron density at a position in space, and how far away am I from that density as I'm performing this outer integral over I and J. So this is this is not a terribly rigorous way to uh, denote this integral, but hopefully it's conceptual, namely that I'm thinking about integrating over space with i and j functions for a given electron being repelled by all the other electrons which themselves are spread throughout space. However, that last term is a problem because it, it is fundamentally a many-body ter term. It, it involves all the electrons. And even for classical particles, much less continuous quantum mechanical particles, that is not a solved problem to, uh, to, to deal with sort of many-body mechanics. So one approximation is to ignore the correlated motion of the electrons. That is, imagine that you have this static distribution of all the other electrons interacting with the one where you're considering the matrix element Ij, and that that assumption of being static is important in the so-called Hartree-Fock approach. It also, of course, introduces a, another complication, namely, you need to know the molecular orbitals in order to construct this term, but we're solving the secular determinant in order to determine the molecular orbitals. So uh, we'll come to that in a moment, but in any case, the Hartree-Fock approach consists of operating with the variational principle for a many electron wave function. So up till now we've talked about one electron wave functions and I've briefly mentioned that a many electron wave function is an, can, can be constructed. It doesn't have to be, but a convenient construction is an anti-symmetrized product of one electron wave functions. 
and that product is called a Slater determinant. So it is arranged to change sign anytime you switch the indices of any two orbitals. And a way to think about that is swapping the electrons between the orbitals if we were to give the electrons numbers somehow. So if you adopt that form for the wave function, and you choose to do so because it turns out you can uh, do some nifty math if you do that, then you are able to follow the so-called Hartree-Fock procedure to optimize your molecular orbitals. And so much like uh, I've discussed so far within the context of sort of a, I guess I'll call it an ideal Hamiltonian, you end up with a secular equation and I've changed it only ever so slightly. I'm using F now in place of H. So this is the so-called Fock matrix. So the Fock matrix is distinguished from the Hamiltonian matrix really only operationally. The Hamiltonian matrix is sort of this notional matrix that reflects uh, energetics of interactions. The Fock matrix is those energetics when you specifically choose to use a Slater determinantal wave function. And so the form of those matrix elements now, they, it is here written out explicitly, involves for any element in the matrix where there are two indices on the Fock matrix, and I'll use little Greek letters because these numbers are running over the basis functions that we're using in our basis set to construct molecular orbitals. So the mu nuth element of the Fock matrix has the one electron integral associated with kinetic energy. So this is integral over all space, this operator, and these functions. The attraction to all of the nuclei so this is a sum of integrals, one electron integrals, running over all space involving the basis functions, one over r, where r is the distance to the nucleus and the charge of the nucleus. And finally, here's where the electron repulsion comes in and also the antisymmetry comes in. So were, were we not required to build antisymmetric wave functions, were the Pauli, Pauli hypothesis somehow uh, not true, we would really only have electron repulsion to worry about. So these are two electron integrals. They run over mu, nu, lambda, sigma. And we've seen two electron integrals before, but I'll, I'll just remind you. So you can think of this as an electron density because it's a product of orbitals, four electron one, a double integral because I'm gonna integrate over the space of one while I'm integrating over the space of two as well. So I'm considering all possible interactions all throughout space one over the distance between the two regions I'm integrating over at any given moment. So distant regions of space will not interact with each other too strongly, and as you get closer, they'll interact more and more. And this must always be a positive number. So the density is a positive, uh, the electron density is a positive number, R is a positive number, so an electron repulsion integral is always positive. This negative sign and a one-half with some switching in indices, these are so-called exchange integrals, and they're the energy you get back from Pauli exchange. So because wave functions are anti-symmetric, you actually get a little bit of energy back. It has consequences in the orbitals as well, because this will influence the values appearing in the matrix and hence influences the coefficients that describe the orbitals. Now the last thing I want to note on here is the density matrix. So in order to do the computation, we actually consider all possible basis functions in these, uh, in these two electron integrals. However, it's really only the basis functions that are used in the occupied molecular orbitals because they are in the right places in space, for instance, and so the electrons want to use them to build the molecular orbitals. They're the only ones that are contributing to repulsion. If I have a basis function that is never used to build an occupied molecular orbital, obviously it never contributes anything to the electron density. So this net electron repulsion is weighted every time you compute it by this density matrix. And the density matrix is simply a way of figuring out. I run over the occupied orbitals and I just ask for lambda and sigma as I consider them, so I've got this indexed by lambda and sigma. So if I think about my mu nuth element and it's being repelled, if there were to be an electron described by the product of lambda and sigma, well, the density matrix tells you, will there be such a thing? Run over the occupied uh, uh, orbitals, so that's the index i, and just ask, is the coefficient for lambda big? Is the coefficient for sigma big? If one of them is zero, I'm never occupying it. I'll never get repulsion. So 
my density matrix element would also be zero, and that term wouldn't count. So it's a way to take all possible electron repulsion integrals, but only uh, add them weighted by how likely they are to occur. All right, so that's all the terms, which hopefully is mildly clear. Uh, and then the Hartree-Fock procedure consists of, now, now let's address this paradox of, but wait a minute, look, my density matrix depends on my coefficients, and aren't I solving this secular determinantal equation in order to get these coefficients? How do I compute a matrix element to begin with? Because I need this to get a matrix element to solve this equation to go back and get the coefficients. And so, of course, what you have to do is you have to make an initial guess. So step one in a Hartree-Fock calculation is choose a basis set, and that'll dictate what, how big is n, and what are all these functions appearing here, mu and nu? What is phi mu? What is phi nu? That's your basis set. Choose a geometry, because you have to know where the atoms are in space. And now go and compute. Since I know where the atoms are and I know my basis set, I can now just compute all these integrals, because usually my basis functions are actually at my atomic positions, but anyway, I know where they are. So I'll compute all these integrals. This is computable, this is computable, this is computable, this is computable. That only depended on geometry and basis set. The one thing I don't know is the density matrix, because I don't know the coefficients. So I can guess an initial density matrix. I just make a, shouldn't be random probably, it could be very crude. My guess could simply be I've got n basis functions and I have 26 electrons, so I'll just fill the first 13 basis functions with two electrons. That's probably a pretty stupid way to do it, but it would be a, an option. And alternatively, you can try to use uh, maybe Huckel theory to make a guess, for example. But electronic structure programs have ways to do that. And now that you have a guess, you've got these values, you now can solve for the, the roots of E. So I solve the Hartree-Fox secular equation. I find the E values that allow me to satisfy it. Every one of those E values gives me a new set of coefficients for uh, molecular orbitals. And since I have those coefficients now, I can construct a new density matrix. So if I started with P0, I'll get orbitals that let me compute P1 after one iteration of this process. And I compare, does P1 look like P0? Is it sufficiently similar? And I'll have to have some level of convergence that I am hoping to achieve. And if the answer is no, and it usually won't be on the first try, well, replace that old density matrix. Sorry, here's the old density matrix. Replace it with the new one. So none of the values of the integrals change, right? I haven't, I've still got all the same basis function and they're still at all the same positions. The only thing that's changed is I have these new values of P, but because those new values of P will affect every Fock matrix element, I have to recompute the values of E that satisfy the secular determinantal equation. With those new values of E, I'll get new molecular orbital coefficients, and I go through the process again. Is my new density matrix sufficiently similar? No, continue to cycle. And in a typical Hartree-Fock calculation, maybe 13 to 15 cycles would be required uh, of course, it's very dependent on the molecule and on the situation, but that's just a, you know, a rough number you might expect, 13 to 15, let's say. And at some point, you'll say, oh, yes, my, my density matrix is converged. My latest one is sufficiently similar to my last one. So at that stage, you have to ask yourself, well, what's your goal? Did you just want an energy? Because if you, if you don't want to change the molecular geometry, you are all done. Uh, just go and you know, examine your wave function, run wild, do all sorts of uh, analyses, have fun. But you may be interested in optimizing the molecular geometry. So in that case, you would have to check the forces on the atoms. We'll talk more about that at a, a later point in the class. And decide, is your geometry converged? So we've already really discussed that in the context of molecular mechanics, and it's not really any different in, in quantum mechanics. It's just uh, more challenging in some sense to compute forces. So if it does not satisfy optimization criteria, you need to choose a new geometry by whatever algorithm you're using to optimize geometries. Because you changed the geometry, you, you now need to recompute all of the overlap, one electron and two electron integrals. And now guess a density matrix. You probably will guess the density matrix that was converged for the last geometry. That seems to make sense and it ought to speed things up for you. And you will once more go through the process of converging the density matrix and you keep looping until finally your geometry seems to be converged and now you can go and run wild analyzing your optimized geometry. All right, well, uh, so that was a lot of uh, symbols and uh, notational convenience to some extent.
To end this lecture, what I'd like you to think about and maybe pull out a piece of paper and just uh, satisfy yourself that you have some appreciation for what the notation means. So these are the integrals that are needed and put together to make a Fock matrix element. And so I suggest to you try writing out in full mathematical notation, okay, not Dirac notation with bras and cats and operators and the like, but uh, in Cartesian coordinates using standard integral symbols and uh, uh, the way you would in a first year calculus course essentially, what do these integrals look like for an actual Slater type orbital basis function? And so you could certainly use that 3p orbital for example that I showed earlier in the lecture. That is a legitimate basis function in Cartesian coordinates. And when you see that, you'll start to get a better feel for what a computer is actually doing as it goes about solving some of these integrals. And it'll also make more apparent why semi-empirical approximations, which replace the actual solution of those integrals with, uh, with values, if you like, that are chosen from empirical reasoning, uh, can be a very efficient way to go about trying to solve the Hartree-Fock equations. And we'll stop there and talk more in the next video.